lecture is on the erosion of property rights. So last week we talked about, and previous weeks we talked about how wonderful property rights are, how great uh, uh, you know common law is, and uh, you know sorting between disputes. But we still have a lot of pollution. We still have a lot of people upset about the situation, clamoring for changes. The question is why? And the answer I'm going to propose and defend today is uh, the reason we have uh, such a calamity when it comes to environmental problems is because there have been interventions through legislation and statutes in the private property sphere. Whenever the government puts forward some legislation, the, the common language that's used today is that uh, we have to do this in the public interest or the public good. You all heard those expressions? Public good, public interest. What does public interest mean? Yes? What, what does the government of that time mean? benefit the most of their people. Any other uh, ideas? What is meant by public benefit or public interest? So people talk about public benefit, benefiting the public. Why is why would we need the public benefit as opposed to what? What's the public benefit or the public interest? What's that opposed to? The individual or the private interest. But I think it was last week, we, uh, we played that game where I asked you guys who prefers apples to bananas, bananas to oranges, and oranges to apples. And we found out that it's not just difficult and hard to determine what the public wants, but it's literally impossible. That was Arrow's impossibility. <laughs> It's literally impossible to determine what the public wants. Who is the public? Who determines what the public is? Who determines what counts and what doesn't count as the public? Is the public just your little town? Is it the whole province? Is it the whole country? Is it the whole world? Who says? It's not an obvious answer. You can't come to it objectively. So that's the first thing you should remember whenever governments talk about doing things in the public interest. The public interest is impossible to define objectively. So what do they have to do? People recognize this intrinsically. So what do they do? They come up with some other makeshift definition of public, whatever is convenient at the moment. Let's just go through some examples. If the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup, is that in the public interest? Yes? What about for the fans of the Vancouver Canucks? Right? What if we stop uh, the production of, uh, of an oil pipeline. Is that in the public interest? A little bit more hesitation to answer this one. Well, it's definitely in the interest of the companies who are building the pipeline, who get to transport the pipeline to and from their sources, the people who get to uh, enjoy cheaper oil, People say, oh, we don't want oil pipelines. Well, the alternative to an oil pipeline is transferring oil by uh, boats or by trucks. And if a boat or ship has an accident with oil, it spills into the sea. If a truck has an accident, the damage will be less, but 
it's way more expensive to transport things via truck. Combustion en engines are way less efficient than a vacuum sealed pipeline. How do you balance those benefits? Well, Hayek had an answer. If you remember from Hayek's uh, 1945 paper, and that was private property, letting individuals decide using prices what they value individually. There was a famous case that involved an organization called KVP Corp. This was in 1946. They were a uh, they were a mill, and you remember from last week we talked about a sawmill uh, that was polluting a river, and we talked about riparian rights in 1900. Riparian rights being upheld by the paper mill uh, being or sawmill, sorry. Uh, having an injunction, even though they spent tens of thousands of dollars uh, in 1900 dollars to solve their, to, to, build, to build that plant, because they were polluting the property of someone else, the court ruled that they had to stop polluting. In 1946, KVP was a uh, uh, company called Kalamazoo Vegetable Parchments. Kalamazoo Vegetable Parchments had built a plant on a river, and they were doing the same thing. They were dumping into the river. People downstream complained. They wanted an injunction. The judge in this case did not give the injunction. Why? Because something had changed from 1900 to 1946, and that was a piece of legislation. It was an act by the Ontario government. Let me just get the name right. It was called the Lakes and Rivers Improvement Act. The Lakes and Rivers Improvement Act. Who could be against the improvement of lakes and rivers? Who, who stands against this act? Who dares to stand against the improvement of lakes and rivers? I do. I will be the devil who will stand up against this. And the reason is that this act had a provision, or has a provision, that allows judges to refuse injunctions if they deem, if the judge deems that uh, by an injunction, the public interest will be harmed. Now they define the public interest as the locality. And the judge in this case, said uh, that the locality will lose jobs and business and all this other stuff, so that the interests of the people downstream don't matter, or they don't matter as much. The private injury is outweighed by the public benefits. So it's okay to injure the river because it benefits, it brings benefits to the locality. That's how they improved the river. That's how that act improved the river, <laughs> by letting the judge determine that it's okay to dump in it because it brings jobs or whatever. You still think that it's great that the government is acting to improve lakes and rivers? Can a judge calculate costs and benefits? What, how can a judge benefit, uh, calculate costs and benefits? What tools could they use? Who's got an idea? Who's got any idea? <coughs> yes? Assuming the judge is a resident of the area in which you would make a decision for, you could consider like, the general efficiency for some people around him. Uh, so the, the answer was, assuming that the judge is from that area, uh, he could make a decision based on what the people around him are saying, right? Any other ideas? Yes? 
Opening up communication with stakeholders from the surrounding area, very similar to, uh, to this suggestion. Any other ideas? Yes? You can look at uh, history, look at past cases, see what the consequences were. That's an interesting uh, uh, answer. We'll get back to that. Any other suggestions? Yes? You could try to assign costs to what the company would lose versus what the um, plaintiff would lose. Yeah, you can assign costs or try to assign costs, is what you said. You can try to assign costs. And that's what judges do. And that's what uh, the role of economic consultants is. Law firms will hire economic consultants, they'll hire economists, and to, to come up and calculate the costs and the benefits for uh, every case. They say, oh, if you do an injunction here, the cost will be X, Y, and Z, but uh, if you don't do the in injunction, then the benefits will be A, B, and C. But the other side will come back and say, they'll get their own economists. And, the, and those economists will say, oh, if you do an injunction, the benefits will be P, Q, and R. But the costs will be S, T, and U. Everyone following along? Each side hires their own economist, and each economist is giving different answers to the same question. It's because they're slightly changing the question. Why? Because prices have not been used in this situation. So they have to invoke something called shadow pricing. Shadow pricing. The concept of shadow pricing was invented in the 1920s by people trying to justify the existence of the USSR. They said that uh, uh, in the 1920s, there was something called the socialist calculation debate. It was about whether a socialist economy can calculate economically using profits and losses. Ludwig von Mises, who you should have talked about in your first lab, said, no, you, you cannot, if you have a socialist economy, you cannot calculate profits and losses. And if you can't calculate profits and losses, you can't make entrepreneurial decisions, and so, in his words, where you'll be groping in the dark as to how to allocate resources. The socialists came back and they said, this is a really good point, but we have a solution. We can just write a system of equations that these system of equations will have all the variables of the economy, and then we'll just solve for the unknowns. We'll have, you know, a thousand equations and a thousand unknowns, but because the unknowns and the equations are identical, we can solve the equations. Problem solved. We can then come up also with other uh, uh, equations where we'll do calculus and the unknown in the calculus that we solve, something called the, like, the Lagrangian. If you guys ever do a, an optimization course um, that's offered at this school, you'll be doing a lot of Lagrangians. The Lagrangian multiplier, they said, would be the shadow price. The shadow price means if we change the cost a little bit, how much would the benefits increase? The shadow, the, the shadow price will tell us how much problem solved. Mises and Hayek came back, and that was the subject of Hayek's 1945 paper that you read. It was in response to the socialists coming back and saying we could just come up with equations. Hayek came back and said, the problem is you're assuming that you know what all the unknowns are. The issue is, in the real world, we don't know what the unknowns are. There are some unknowns that we know about, but there are so, also some unknowns that we don't even know about. There are unknown unknowns. You've heard that expression? There are <coughs> unknown unknowns that you can't plug into an equation. But people still pretend that they can do so with this method of shadow pricing. And they'll say, it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing, right? Well, one thing is not as good as it's real prices. And we get real prices when we have real exchange of property in markets. But if the government says you can't have real exchange of property because of the public interest, 
You can't have markets, you can't have prices. You're gonna have to grow up in the dark to figure out who's winning and who's losing. Yes? So this is, you, you don't have to know this at all, okay? So I'm just gonna write it out. So you'll have some revenue function, and then you'll have some, it, it will be, we'll say, f of x. You'll have some cost function, we'll say g of x, and then you'll have, we'll set up your Lagrangian, which will be f of x minus lambda g of x minus c. You don't have to know this, right? And then you take the partial deri derivatives, dl to df, dl to dg, and dl to d lambda. And then whatever lambda is, you solve for lambda from that situation, that's your shadow. Any other questions? Yes? You solve for a shadow place? Yeah. You, you solve for a shadow place. Any other questions? So I've got another case, uh, just briefly. 1955. Richmond Hill, the city, was dumping sewage into the river. People downstream from the river complained about the, uh, about the pollution. They take it to court. Richmond Hill says we had to dump the sewage into the river. Why do you think? Public interest. The government of Ontario said, though, and that's where they had to take the court. The government of Ontario said it's true that that's in the public interest, but we have also another public interest, which is protecting the lakes and rivers. But you also have the duty to protect the people downstream. So you have all these different competing notions that the government has to do at the same time. They set up different notions of public interest, and sometimes they get into conflict with each other. In that specific case, in 1955, Richmond Hill was found uh, guilty of uh, breaking the public interest. Why? Why would the Why would Richmond Hill say that it was in the public interest to dump sewage into the river? Why Why could they possibly say that? Yeah. Damaging their soil quality, and then they could have said that's more uh, that's worse. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's uh, that's very close, right? So that's they say, oh, if we went and did, uh, if we disposed of this uh, the sewage in a different way, then that would have cost more money. That would have been a burden on our taxpayers. We would have to raise taxes to pay for that. And our community, we like them. We like them to spend their own money. And so it's in the public interest to keep taxes low. It's in the public interest to keep taxes low if you want to dump sewage in the river. But if you want to prevent air pollution, the argument is now it's in the public interest to increase taxes for carbon prices. You see how there are these different, we call them tensions. This is something called the problem of interventionism. The common law, customary law, they've evolved over many, many thousands of years. We've had many, many thousands of years of experience trying to figure out all the different problems that can arise 
when two people have a dispute over property, over trespass and nuisance. Interventionism is the idea that uh, the government, the state, gets to intervene in the functioning of the economy for the public interest. This idea is only about a couple hundred years old. Because it's only a couple hundred years old, we still haven't worked out all the kinks. So we still get issues where one agency is in charge of doing one thing in the public interest, and another agency is doing another thing which, which they think is in the public interest, but together they are contradictory. For example, the dairy board is in charge with keeping the interests of uh, the farmers um, well by keeping prices up. How they do this is by creating a cartel where uh, they limit the number of dairy products that get to come to market in Canada. This keeps prices up, which makes a lot of benefit for uh, the, the egg and dairy farms. They also exert a lot of pressure when it comes to international trade agreements, which limit international, uh, the importation of international uh, dairy egg products. On the other hand, we have a government agency which is responsible for ending cartels and monopolies. Because they say our job is to keep prices low for Canadians. These two agencies are in direct conflict with each other. So they come up with another policy which says what are you going to do? How are they going to solve this? And the solution is a truce. Government agencies don't sue other government agencies. Not typically. Because imagine if the, you had to pay a fine. Uh, one government agency had to pay a fine for breaking the rules of another government agency. Well, where does the agency get its money from? Taxes. So it would have to raise money from people by increasing taxes. That's less money in their pocket. Prices would go up even more because of this, relatively because your incomes are low. Things would get less affordable. Questions? That wasn't the problem of interventionism. The real problem of interventionism is that one intervention leads to another. One intervention goes like this. So you have a problem. I'm going to put this problem in quotes. I don't think a lot of times it's a real problem because they say this is a problem of public interest, but the public interest is impossible to define. So they have a problem, quote unquote, and this causes them to intervene. <clears throat> but by intervening, because we don't have a real science of intervention yet, we still get what economists call unintended consequences. So they say minimum wage, we'll talk about this uh, in a couple of weeks, but <coughs> unintended consequence of minimum wage. You ask most people, should we have a higher minimum wage? They say yes. Why? Because a higher minimum wage means higher wages for people at the bottom of the ladder. Obvious, right? Economists come back, looked at this seriously and said, wait, if you increase the minimum wage, that makes more people unemployable. That means fewer people will have jobs, and uh, the people who do have jobs, their hours might be cut. Incomes will, in general, go down by increasing the minimum wage. So now you have a problem. Well, you have new problems. You could have multiple new problems. So now you have people with minimum wage example that they're now unemployed. They used to have a job, now they're unemployed. So now you need another intervention. So you get all these other problems, problems, problems. So now you need other interventions. Intervention, intervention, intervention. And then these also get other problems. And then they keep bringing out. That's the problem of interventions. You intervene, you 
don't know what to expect from your intervention. You create new problems, and then now you need new solutions, which are just going to be more interventions. Questions? Elasticities again? No. Let's talk about war, the economics of war. Have you heard of a wartime economy? Yes? Who said yes? Where'd you hear about wartime economy? From the history. Oh, that's good. So, during a war, does it make sense for the government to take over the production process in order to ensure more uh, materials for war and less materials for luxury goods? See a lot of nodding heads. Anyone say no? Anyone have an argument for no? Okay. In war, you have a country with an objective, which is to uh, survive. Right? The survival of its own people. It needs guns, it needs ammo, it needs tanks, it needs submarines, it needs planes. And the argument is, without these, uh, uh, we, if it has just an open market, the open market just won't be paying, uh, won't be supplying these things. So now we need to take over factories and, and other businesses in order to provide these things we have to uh, draft people into the military and force them to work in, uh, in different um, businesses that they wouldn't have been working in otherwise. But let me make the case. How does the government know how many planes and uh, guns and ammo it needs? How does it know? You think the generals have an idea? So the generals say, okay, we want to invade Normandy. Uh, the general says, okay, we want 100,000 troops. Well, one general says, I want 100,000 troops. The other general says, we only have a million troops in total. 100,000 going to Normandy. We'd have to be pulling troops from other fronts. How do we determine which fronts we should be pulling from? We run into the same knowledge problem as before. We want more guns. Of course we want more guns. Everybody wants more of everything all the time. The problem is we don't have enough. How do we allocate what we have versus uh, for what we want? Yeah. Right, so you could have a strategy, but what's a strategy if not just entrepreneurship without crisis? Right? So you say, oh, if we won Normandy, that'd be excellent. <coughs> but what if you won Normandy at the expense of winning in Tripoli, at the expense of winning in other places, and you lose troops there, you lose civilians there, the enemy would get a stronghold in those areas. So the situation also is that you still need prices. Let me tell you about the history of, uh, uh, of the countries, the Allies and the, the Axis, um, before World War II. Before World War II, England had more planes than all of Germany and Russia. 
combined. <clears throat> England had more boats. England had more of everything because Germany and Russia had been completely taken over by central planning for at least a decade in Germany's case, uh, three or four decades in, in Russia's case. And they were groping in the dark that whole time and they were reducing their own growth. They had fewer stuff to begin with. And you think that just because it is now an emergency that people are more uh, irrational, more uh, emotionally basing their arguments, now they're gonna have time to sit down and really <coughs> think about what costs and benefits? No. Yes? You don't think England had more slaves than both the Southern Islands? They were a smaller country. Okay. They were a smaller country, but they were richer. They were an island, but they were richer. They had a smaller population, but they were richer. They had less arable land, but they were richer. Because they had more access to free trade, more private enterprise, more domestic trade, more prices to make decisions with. And the prices allowed supply to shift to where it was most needed. And then when the war effort came, and England, just like the United States and every other uh, previously capitalistic country, fell under this ruse of wartime economy, they centrally planned and they reduced total production. They reduced total output. But because they still had the memory, the much more recent memory of prices, of outputs, of what consumers wanted, they could still outproduce relative to the Germans and the Japanese and the Soviets before they split. And the <coughs> Italians, of course. If you have a factory, well, if the government wants more bullets and tanks and they don't take over factories, the alternative is that they have to pay for it through taxes, right? If they pay for it, they have to pay prices. And if, the, if they really need the tanks, they'll bid higher prices for it. By bidding for higher prices for tanks, that naturally diverts resources from other things into more tank production, into more gun production, into more ammo production, etc. And away from Japanese cheesecake production. That's just the natural functioning of the price system. That if you that if you have prices for things, people paying real prices for things, that will give information to entrepreneurs what to produce more of. If prices are going up, get into that business. If prices are going down, and you foresee them going down even further, get out of that business. If the government is buying things at market value, then it's incentivizing the market to build more things for it, and build less things that it uh, otherwise would build. Anyone have questions on war economy? You see the connection though, right? Between a war economy and planning for a better environment. In both cases, they say, we want to, we, there's a national interest that we have to work towards. That we all have to work towards collectively. We make uh, private sacrifices to, make, uh, to, to work towards this public end. Yes? Do not be arguing that it would be different because in war you have more visible and more personal consequences where for things like climate change, it's harder for the individual to observe the dangers and therefore they're less likely to act in conflict and now. So that's a good point. The question was, can we say that they're different because in a war it's easier to see what the costs are versus in climate change? That's fair. The problem is that not everyone goes to war equally. If you were in Toronto, probably you did not feel the war so much as if you were in a suburb elsewhere where maybe half your town got drafted. Toronto was a town of a million people. And not everyone from Toronto, people had education, people could afford to avoid the draft by going to university, etc. So you could get away uh, from, from some of those costs of war through other means. 
But just because you can see something, you can personally feel the psychology more towards it, does not change the fact that you just still don't have prices to calculate economically. You still need prices. If you don't have prices, it doesn't matter if you see it or you can't see it. Because the benefits of education, you don't see it today, you won't see it next year, you'll probably see it in 10 years or 20 years, you'll be somewhere and you'll be like, hey, I remember taking a class on this, and that's when it'll kick in. You won't see it now. Same with going to a regular doctor checkup, you don't know, you go there and then you don't know if they'll find cancer or something else, or you'll be uh, in a clean bill of health. You don't know, but we still have ways of pricing unseen goods and long-term goods. We can still do it through prices. And what uh, you'll read in the in the Brubaker Elizabeth Brubaker chapters for this uh, for this class, the reading for today, is that there's a history. If you go back to chapters one through three, you'll see the history of how courts used to rule, and then chapters uh, uh, four, five, and six, or seven, I think we go up to today, you'll see how <coughs> government came and changed the way the courts were already ruling in order to make things worse from your perspective today by encouraging more pollution than otherwise would have happened. I'll just end today by making a distinction between the public good good or the public interest or the public benefit is some philosophical idea. It's a sense. You can't define it. Public goods in economics are any goods that are non rivalrous and non excludable. <coughs> Non-rivalrous means that if I consume some of this good, there's just as much left as for you to consume. The opposite would be rivalrous. So a pizza, if I have one slice of pizza, that's one slice fewer for the rest of you. Non-rivalrous means if I have a slice of pizza, another slice is just, just there. It's as if I didn't take a slice at all. Non-excludable, means you can't exclude other people from using that thing. If I have a pizza and I put it in the safe, you can't use that pizza now. So I've excluded you from that pizza by putting it in a safe, putting a fence around it. You can think of uh, it as a box. You've got rival and non-rival and excludable and non-excludable. Something in this corner, excludable and rival, is like pizza. Something that's uh, excludable but non-rival. Well, something that's excludable but non-rival. We call this a club good. So a club, theoretically, everyone in the world can be part of a club, but we still like to exclude people from clubs for whatever reason. We call this a club good. Something that's rival but non-excludable. Any idea what rival but non-excludable is? Think of uh, ocean fishing or tuna set. The tuna is a rival resource. If I take a ton of tuna, that's one ton less of tuna for everyone else. But for whatever reason, no one's allowed to own the ocean. So any idiot can come by and take some tuna. So we call this a common pool. Common pool. Resource. And then the last one, non-rival, non-excludable, is a public. Anyone can give me an example of a public good? Ex 
example. What about, what about defense, national defense? Is that a public good? She says yes. She says no. Why not? So the government can exclude citizens if they, for political reasons. They can also exclude citizens if they just don't have enough resources, right? So the military is only a certain size. They only have so many uh, army men and, and ships and uh, planes, etc. And if there's a war, they can only go to so many places at once. They leave other places alone. So I've got a few more minutes, guys. Who's got more examples of a public good? So, national defense is not one. Yes. Like air. air? What about uh, in China, in Beijing, where people have tanks of gas for air? Or when you're underwater? It's still, well, fresh air, right? Fresh air. So, fresh air is an issue, right? So, you can still put it in a tank if, if you're underwater or if you're in a very polluted area. It's not a public good. Yes? But like roads and highways be a public good? Roads and highways is another common example of a public good. But, uh, you guys ever hear of the 407? <coughs> right? They charge a toll. They charge a price to enter the 407. You can do that. You can put a little barrier there. Not everyone can use it. You can exclude people from a road. Yeah? Could you also count roads as potentially walking roads? Because they have like yeah. Exactly. They're also rivals. Those are also rivals. One last suggestion from anyone? Freedom? Not quite. Speech? What if you're in someone else's house? Go to someone else's house and say, you know, mother's fat. They can ask you to leave, right? That limits your speech. The hint is information. 